Hey guys, uh, happy Monday. Uh, this is my first video diary uh, since Friday. Kind of not a lot happened over the weekend. Um, new to report, but uh, we're back and I'll be doing these uh, again all week. A few things uh, to start off. One is, as part of this update, you'll see that there's a play test this evening at 8 p.m that uh, Eastern time that I'll be there for and um, hoping to get some signups for that. Um, if you wanna tune in, that will be streaming live on the Kickstarter page uh, or on YouTube. And um, if you wanna play, that's even better, hop in. There'll be spots for four people. Um, usually I play with people, uh, but if there are four people, uh, I, I don't necessarily have to play. I see a lot of people in the comments uh, discussing the idea of additional sort of the modular boards from first edition being reprinted, potentially along with uh, the Fringe Underground expansion from first edition. Uh, and this is something I discussed in a previous update. So I'm, I'm still looking into the possibility of this. Um, my biggest concern is um, making sure that there's enough interest because there's sort of minimum print quantities uh, for this stuff, um, probably in the range of a thousand units. Right now we're sitting at 1100 uh, backers. I expect we'll uh, hopefully more than double that before the end of the campaign, um, but it, you know, it's a concern, right? So you produce something, um, especially as an add-on product that's sort of not sellable by itself, uh, at least as a standalone, um, and there's the risk that it doesn't sell and it sits there uh, and costs money basically to warehouse for until it's until it's all gone. Um, so, what I'll probably do uh, today or or tomorrow is uh, send out a survey basically and get a sense of how many of you would be interested in such a thing uh, based on. Uh, sort of an approximate price point. I'm I'm still trying to get a price from my um, manufacturing partner. Um, I actually haven't sent that to him yet, but uh, they're pretty quick to respond, and I should have an answer today if I reach out to them today. So, um, yeah. That being said, I will get a survey out to you guys, and if there's enough of you who are interested, um, then then we can go there. Regarding the, um. Fringe Underground in particular, there are still enough of them left that I, I hesitate to, to print, reprint that uh, since it exists already um, and it's available to most people. Um, those of you who are in, in farther off regions, uh, it, it becomes a little bit more of a problem. I saw someone uh, commenting regarding uh, shipping to Australia and that is potentially a problem. However, uh, there are... As far as I know, there are still a few copies left in Australia um, uh, of Quad Heroes and potentially um, the the expansion content, the the cloth and uh, dice bag. And um, the problem is, I'm not working directly with that partner. Um, that's one of QML's people, and the process is sort of convoluted to find out exactly what's there and how to get that. Or, um, order processed. So uh, at least right now, QML is, is very busy um, and kind of slow to respond to those kinds of requests. So there is potential there that if you're there and you would like that stuff now, uh, that it that it is available. I just have to, and obviously for not the expensive cost of shipping it from the US to, to Australia. Um, so that essentially covers that. Uh, not a lot of other new housekeeping stuff. I continue to work um, today and I was working over the weekend. I took Saturday off for my first kind of real day off and uh, yeah, uh, quite, a, quite a long time. Uh, so I got some sun on Saturday and just sort of responded to a few comments, but Danny hold it down, hold it, held it down the fort uh, for me. And I, I just sort of hung out with a friend and tried to relax. Um, yesterday I did some work and on the uh, Kickstarter video, I really feel like the the campaign, as you guys have said, needs something that sort of gives you a better sense of gameplay. Um, and the Kickstarter for the first edition game had 
a more of that as part of the video. Some kind of repurposing the uh, the voiceover from that, which was done by uh, the remarkable Peter Baker, who's done voices for a lot of things and and on other other Kickstarter campaigns, um, and adapting that to uh, second edition. So that will be better in terms of giving people a a better sense of how the game plays. Uh, in addition to that, I'll be adding uh, graphics and animated bits to the page that do a better job of explaining different types of scenarios, that kind of thing. I mean, I have a couple of uh, graphics up there now, uh, but I think they don't do a good enough job to give people a sense of what it's like. Um, over the weekend, there were uh, there was a play test, at least one, uh, with Danny. And one of the things that, I, I, that always comes out of those play tests is uh, people end up backing the game. Uh, or if you're at a convention and you play it, uh, people walk away with the game. And, and that's consistent uh, throughout all of my experience with Quad Heroes, is that it's it's kind of hard to grok, to understand, just by looking at pictures of it. They, they see the cute minis, they see boards with, you know, uh, with a grid on them. Uh, but that's really as far as it uh, goes. Uh, so people don't really get a sense of it, right? And uh, it's an obscure enough game that there really isn't a lot of awareness about it. Um, I really do feel like we should be way beyond where we are in, in the campaign, even though we're doing fantastically, um, just because of how unique this game is and how how good it is. Uh, I mean, <laughs> everybody says that about their games. Uh, I, I Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, that's all I'll say about this, but also there's a new uh, Quackalope video um, here uh, on the page that I posted at Quack and Co. Uh, Jesse um, posted a video actually at the start of the campaign, basically, but I didn't notice it uh, until uh, Danny brought it to my attention uh, over the weekend. So check that out. It's on the Kickstarter page. Feel free to go uh, look at his uh, at all of the videos that have been posted by by people and, and give some support to those uh, content creators. Like and comment. Uh, subscribe if you can, uh, because what these guys do uh, for us creators, especially the small ones, it, it like it means a ton for for us, for me as a as a creator from a tiny company that's just me uh, and some very helpful volunteers like Danny. Um, it means a lot, and it, it goes a long way uh, for you guys if you watch those videos to you know show some support, um, particularly if you comment and like. Um, it shows that uh, people appreciate that what they do. Um, anyway, so for the rest of this video, uh, what I want to do is I have both my first edition and uh, partial second edition prototype here. And I want to talk about some of the differences between the two games. Um, first, the obvious ones, uh, the painted minis versus non-painted minis. Um, and I don't have the reference cubes. I don't have samples of what those look like. Uh, but they, they'll essentially be the same size as a mini, uh, only like a plastic, like a die with full color screen printing on each side. They'll be really high quality, nice piece in the hand uh, and probably a nice decent, excuse me, weight to them. Um, but so here, here's the first edition Captain Zozo. Uh, you can see it's nicely ink washed, but it's not painted. Um, and here is a sample for second edition painted minis. So the actual minis uh, won't be identical to this. Uh, these were produced by a, a different factory than what we'll actually be using. Uh, but um, actually, I don't even know if this was came from a factory, really. I don't know the process that was involved in making it, but uh, it's the same mold. Uh, so it's identical mini. Um, but anyway, we've changed manufacturers for this, this go round, and we haven't got samples yet because the molds are still in the hands of the, the, the previous company. Anyway, so yeah, primary difference is second edition comes with painted minis, uh, at least the, the primary visual difference uh, from the outside. The second relates to uh, something that's, that I've mentioned earlier today, and that's modular game boards. So, um, so first edition has these modular game board boards, and you can see there's you know beautiful spot UV. Uh, each is double sided, and it came with nine of them. Um, I don't know if I have all nine here. I have uh, a few different copies of first edition that are uh, sort of scattered around, mixed mixed 
together. So I think actually I only have one, two, three, four, five, six. I have seven of the nine boards here, but the other two are somewhere in the house or in another box. But there's quite a bit of variety here in terms of, you know, what, what the content, there's a ginormous pit. Um, but the fact that they're modular uh, does make it um, fun uh, to create your own scenarios. Although, um, yeah, anyway, I, I, we'll talk about that in a second. So the other, here's a couple of the boards from the Fringe Underground expansion. There are actually three. I don't know where the third one is. Uh, I do have to put together a complete copy at some point. This is uh, my copy that I brought to Gen Con, um, basically to just have in the glass cabinet. And I opened another copy while I was there uh, to, to play with. Um, so yeah, a, a Fringe Underground adds lava, which uh, doesn't exist in second edition, except uh, for some tokens uh, that the character Ember can place on the board. Um, yeah, so these are also beautiful and add some additional scenarios in the Fringe Underground expansion. So uh, this is available on uh, wondermentgames.com uh, if you are interested in it um because the reprint on this in particular is perhaps a long shot we'll see um at least a reprint during this campaign so modular boards is another thing so the other significant difference and probably the biggest difference in terms uh, of how it affects gameplay um i have here a stack of uh prototype second edition player boards and they're still shrink wrapped I have another copy of second edition of prototype, but it's all still jumbled up in the box from uh, Gen Con. So I, I wanted to not have to sort through cards on camera to figure out what's what. Um, yeah, so the player boards and the player experience, um, trying to find the same character basically, uh, each player board so you can see the different. I noticed earlier that the two uh, sort of mini samples that I have, which are Pinky and Captain Zozo, I don't have the player boards on hand for those for first edition for whatever reason. Um, so I'm just going to grab, let's go with Ang, Ang Min, and find, there we go. So the first thing you'll notice is there is a significant size difference uh, in these. And also the print on this will be more vibrant like it is here. But uh, this is uh, like it was a sample and, and they didn't have color reference and probably the files I sent were uh, set up properly or kind of in a hurry. But anyway, the, the vibrance of the colors here will be matched on here. Uh, these are also quite a bit thicker uh, than this. This was a sort of thinner card, but these are also double-sided, you'll notice. Um, it basically acted as a sort of second way to play with the skills in the upgrades, uh, but the primary sort of mode was on side A here. Um, so yeah, the second edition player boards uh, have fewer components. Uh, so the first edition uh, has five skill tiles. The queue is kind of locked on the board um, and six uh, sort of yeah, five skill tiles and six uh, upgrade tiles. Uh, this time around, the player board is smaller, uh, sort of simpler from a, to understand. We have now six tiles. The, there's a sort of skill tile for the queue now. It always has to be assigned to the queue, uh, to the sort of head of the character that, where the queue is. Uh, but these are double-sided, the same identical size as the first time around, but sort of fewer of them. Uh, on top of that, we have Q powers, or sorry, crystal powers here on the board. Uh, and those essentially are when you collect a crystal from the board, they augment your, your hero uh, as you're carrying those things, giving you new powers. And we've really improved the way that the Q uh, works on the, on the character. So in first edition, uh, the Q is essentially, you're not moving, but it activates a special power. In first edition, that allowed you to rearrange your skill tiles um, and activated a secondary uh, sort of special power that was unique to your hero. But they were, while thematic, uh, something that you often didn't want to use during a game. Um, and that was a problem from a game design standpoint because I wanted that to be, I mean, there were reasons to activate your queue in first edition for sure. However, uh, I wanted it to be sort of a game changing thing. It represents something significant that that character can do that's very thematic as well. Like, um, so 
we've really done that, I think, with second edition. Um, if you want to play a demo, you'll sort of get a sense of that. And all of these powers, uh, the Q power and the uh, crystal powers, are really unique. They're different among all the players or all the different heroes. So when you play these guys, and even the skill tiles, when they the upgraded side, while they don't necessarily offer uh, a lot of different uh, sort of thematic powers, they're sort of differently scaled numbers. And there are a few uh, characters that have unique reverse sides um, that do something uh, special. So player experience is a huge part of what's different about the second edition. Uh, and yeah, here's uh, the player boards with the, or sort of the punch boards for at least the prototype uh, for second edition. And uh, the second is tokens. Uh, there are hundreds of tokens in first edition, and there are quite a few in second edition. This is not quite all of the tokens for second edition, um, but it's what was, what. there are two punch board sheets in here. Um, and some of these won't be uh, necessarily replicated uh, for people who upgrade because some of this stuff is identical uh, between the two versions, like the, the walls and broken walls and uh, spring tokens uh, are really the same between the two. So those, if you already own first edition and you get the upgrade, th there'll be one or two punch boards that you don't get, probably just one, uh, and only just get the new uh, the new punch boards. But there are some there are some new things here, but there are fewer, uh, and there are a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, one is that in first edition, the secrets. Uh, so there's like a token that has a question mark on the back. There were at like lots and lots of different secret tokens. And I can show you um, the little organizer we have for the secrets. Uh, this is part of the wood organizer that you can purchase as an add-on. Uh, so these are the different types of secret tokens. Um, yeah, and there are technically more, but these are sort of common base game ones. Um, although I may have these somewhat mixed up, but anyway. So what they represent basically is uh, something on the board kind of like the little boxes on Mario Kart. When you step on them, you get a boost of some kind. So these, uh, when you set up a scenario, it would tell you to grab certain secret tokens, shuffle them, and then place them in the places on the board uh, specified by the scenario. The problem with that is that we have to have dozens of these tokens, and you have to have a way to organize them. And first edition didn't have an organizer, which is really the primary reason why the the, the wood uh, organizer uh, that fits in your box was designed because uh, we've had a few years of people saying we need an organizer solution. There are some that you can 3D print. There are even some wood ones uh, out there that people have made and shared the plans for. But we wanted to have an official version that you know that we designed and uh, could offer as part of a Kickstarter. So first edition has a lot of components and. For second edition, we wanted to make things uh, easier to handle. And one way we did that was we created a secret deck instead. And, and the secret tokens themselves just have a question mark on one side. The other side will have numbers, but that's not used in most scenarios. It's more of a solo play thing. Um, but they just have question marks. And when you land on a secret, you draw a card from the secret deck, which are these cards. And one of the, the great things about that, there, there's a whole bunch of advantages to doing it that way. One is that you can do things that are more uh, deeply thematic. So one of the, like what I wanted those secrets to represent in first edition was an encounter of some kind. Um, and it, I mean, or like just a surprise, but what we're, what we're able to do this time around is have a little more theme involved. So the cards can say something like you've met so-and-so do this. Uh, but also you can find other types of cards there as well. And uh, some additional sort of, uh, the secret deck anyway is is kind of a lot of fun and um, it's also part of the player boards now. So when you activate your queue on your character, you get to draw a card from the secret deck. So that represents the character sort of, you know, being upwards alert and looking around and discovering something. Um, but there are also tokens on the board that, that let you get these. So. Uh, some examples that this is, I don't even know what this card does, but let's just read it. Um, uh, animal Kinship. So this is a, a secret card. Has some text up top that you read. Uh, this one says, 
An animal emerges from uh, behind a boulder. I apologize, my eyes are not the best uh, these days. And my light is very dim, there we go. An animal emerges from behind a boulder. Uh, it seems to like your pet. Draw the top card of the pet deck. You may keep and use both pets. Uh, each pet still gets uh, one activation per turn. So normally players can only have a single pet. Now you can have two and that's a, an amazing thing. Um, so there's a whole bunch of secrets here. Um, and they, they add quite a bit to the game, and, but also remove a bunch of tokens that you don't need to organize. You don't need to worry about setting up. Uh, it just makes things simpler. Um, the other thing is we've items and pets at one point were in, were in first edition were part of the main exploration deck. There were, uh, which which is a was a good thing um, we thought. Um, actually, it's not bad. I mean, you play first edition, it's still it's still a great game. But what like a primary design objective for for second edition was to enhance the things that people like about the game streamline things and just make it easier to play to get to the table, that kind of thing. Um, so while you were playing first edition, one of the frustrations was if you're looking for cards that you can have an immediate impact and you're happy with the items and pets that you have, if you have them, because you didn't start with them in, in the previous game, you'd have to draw into them, um, is you wouldn't want to draw additional items and pets because they're you can only use one per turn. So uh, the idea was that since people loved items and pets, uh, that was a, you know one thing that we really got from play testing and feedback from people, um, especially young people. They love just the idea of having a pet. It's fun. It's like Pokemon <laughs> sort of thing. Uh, but so what we decided to do was make item and pet decks. And at the start of the game, players choose uh, from among three of each type uh, to start the game with. And, and what that does is creates... Uh, a real ability to create sort of some synergy and a new strategy for your hero. And I think it's a, it's a great addition to uh, second edition is having those separated out. It, it makes that your draws mid game from the, the deck more significant um, and gives you power right at the start of the game uh, to do some fun stuff with your, with your items and pets. They can, you can still acquire new ones through the course of the game, um, swap them out, that kind of thing. But having these, uh, as sort of separate things, they have their own card backs. Um, is is a is a pretty great improvement to the game in a bunch of ways. So, the last uh, sort of major difference from a gameplay standpoint is the event deck. So, first edition, it the turn structure it remains the same, but we no longer have a, a round structure in in uh, in the traditional sense where at the end of a round we had a first player token that would pass so that would change every turn um, and we did a bunch of stuff at the end of each round we upgraded at the end of each each uh, round of players taking their turns and then we did maintenance on the board which was moving moving platforms or sheep or bombs or anything that moves would, would move so what that did though is it if that's happening every round it, it kind of slows the game down a little bit um, and the other thing um about the events in the first edition game is a lot of people found them too brutal um it was to some anyway um too much chaos and too much potential for the game beating you uh particularly in the, in the case of the solo stuff if you would draw a certain event it could just end your game i mean not literally saying game over but just make it really hard to win um and for someone like me uh from a design standpoint i I don't mind the idea of, I'll, I'll preface this by saying the first edition game, the idea was the, the world here is supposed to have gone through a cataclysm. There's earthquakes and all kinds of stuff happening because asteroids crashed into the planet. So the planet is still settling and all kinds of crazy things are happening, um, like storms and wind and earthquakes and all of that, right? So thematically, the events from first edition make sense uh, to me anyway, as the designer. But for many people, um, they could ruin the fun. And my answer traditionally was, well, just either not use them or take the cards out that you don't want. But that's not a traditional answer from a board game, uh, from a board game creator, right? If if the piece is in the game, then you should be using it, right? That's that's how people think about it. 
Uh, but Quad Heroes is very much a sandbox. Um, the core game system in terms of how you move, how you interact with the boards, how cards play, all of that stuff is, is the system. Um, but a lot of the, the, the peripheral pieces and particularly the rules in terms of what the scenario is, that kind of thing, are flexible by on purpose because it's a scenario based game, right? So you set the rules for the, the scenario, like what you're doing and uh, how to do it um, as part of the setup of a game. So anyway, long story short, um, the event the events now happen at the end of each player's turn and they also trigger things. Uh, so some of the cards in this deck, um, I think there are 21 cards in the uh, event deck as it stands and uh, six of them are triggers. When a trigger occurs, that's when all players will upgrade. Um, uh, and also move any board elements like bombs that happen to be on the board or sheep or whatever. Um, so it's not happening constantly, uh, which makes the game flow uh, more quickly. But it's also variable, which makes it so that between from game to game, you may not get the same number of upgrades, which is actually a good thing from my perspective and from a play experience, because it helps you adapt. Um, but the more players you play with, the faster things accelerate, which means that uh the game with more players doesn't necessarily take longer uh because as players upgrade they move farther right so it it actually works well to keep game lengths down because players become heroic more quickly uh because you're drawing more from the deck uh as you play with more more players um anyway yeah so the events are changed and they're also in in many cases the negative effects of events can be avoided by players and sometimes are optional you can choose to to interact with them or not um yeah and and but one of the things that um about doing it this way as well is that particularly for solo play uh events can be done in different ways uh that are very thematic and specific to that scenario so We'll talk about that more when we get into the outlining solo content uh, in a later update, um, solo slash co-op. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. So I did want to show that. So this is a, a crystal from first edition. These are all first edition crystals. I've painted these ones uh, just to get a sense of you know how they will be in second edition uh, versus first edition. The bases are uh, the same color as the crystal itself. So these, this is a really, uh, like if you have first edition and you're concerned about not getting the painted stuff in your upgrade, these are really quick to paint. I painted this whole set and I'm not a particularly good painter. Um, I painted the whole set of crystals while watching TV at Gen Con and it, it took me maybe 35 or 40 minutes. Um, I also have the sheep here. Uh, I do have the sheep. Where did I put them? Ah, good. So these again, I painted myself, but the second edition sheep will come painted. There are three kinds of sheep, uh, white, brown, and black. Uh, and again, I, I painted these not particularly well, but it was also a quick paint job. It like, they really don't take long. Um, yeah, so I mean, in terms of first edition upgrades, like people are concerned about not getting the sheep or the, the crystals. I, like, I honestly believe that it's, it's not really a, a big deal. Um, in terms of the additional cost, essentially getting those those things as add-ons would have to cost the same as buying the full game because the difference between the upgrade kit and the second edition um, full game is is really the cost of it is in this stuff. And uh, I, I understand that everybody wants everything, but in order to get that, you basically have to buy the the full second edition game if you want painted minis and sheep. Because adding those, because there's quite a few of each of those, uh, does does significantly increase the cost. Um, yeah. So the last thing I wanted to discuss, and there are a few other differences in terms of uh, content uh, between the games. Like uh, first edition has what's called Overlord Lord mode, which is another deck of cards uh, where uh, it, for a one versus all mode. Um, which is not part of uh, second edition at this point. Um, and that was part of a few scenarios. There's still the, the potential uh, for one versus all scenarios in second edition. Just how that's approached is slightly different. Um, okay, so the last thing is in 
that I wanted to discuss here, it, I know this is probably going quite long, are the game boards I haven't actually shown. So I don't have uh, a final sort of prototype for a uh, second edition game board. So what I have in this was basically just because I wanted uh, something to demo with at Gen Con this year. So I don't have a fold out book, but I have these, I have two of them uh, fold out maps. But what this represents is if this is a fold out scenario book, the ring uh, binding would be here. Like by ring, I mean like spiral bound. Uh, and then this would be the part that folds out from it, although it wouldn't fold backwards, it would fold forward because there's a, a ring there. Um, so what the advantage of doing boards like this, uh, and the, the primary reason was setup, uh, setup speed. So I wanted to create a game that is retail friendly. Uh, and what that means is reduce component count for confusion and cost. Um, and and making the game easy to set up and play. So in this case, uh, this is not obviously final. There would be instructional text here on what to do in the scenario and how to set it up. Um, and this area is sort of potential board space for some boards and has the compass on it. Um, and I've, I've placed these token markers, but the final artwork for the board won't, uh, won't have those. Um, anyway, so what this does is that I can, throw the game down on the table, open the board, and place uh, five or six secret tokens, which I don't have to search for. I just grab the secret tokens, and they'll be in a little organizer uh, in the plastic insert and the wood ones. Um, so it's very easy to grab grab them and set them up, and then place uh, five or six crystals on the board. And then we're ready to go um, outside of choosing items and pets and characters, which is also uh, quite simple. And the a wood insert each character comes with its own little uh, holder and this works for both first and second edition in second edition you put your uh, painted painted hero and your reference cube will both fit in here uh, and the the token for your hero and your uh, six skill tiles and if you have any additional tokens they'll fit on the opposite side so uh, as an upgrader you won't need your first edition player boards and skill tiles and upgrades anymore um, if you want to play with the first edition rules you can keep that stuff but it won't all fit in the box uh, because essentially you're you're replacing the rule set uh, for <clears throat> for first edition so that upgrades the, the replaces the player boards and tokens for them so setup is way faster uh, with second edition. Um, and the, the the other really significant advantage to doing this is that we can do custom artwork on boards because the boards don't have to be completely modular. They don't have to be able to rotate. Um, and it lets us do things like having these impassable objects that let us create different kinds of scenarios that are, are frankly more interesting uh, from like, the ability to make something uh, new and different on each game board. Um, so that's it's a really a big advantage. But uh, saying that, the all of the first edition board content still works here uh, in second edition. So you can play all of your second edition scenarios or create your own content using uh, using the second edition content. So you, they, they work seamlessly together. So that this is... Uh, the Great Race scenario, which is the one we mostly demo on uh, Tabletop Simulator. I also produced uh, the Sheep Soccer board for this, even though we didn't play it at Gen Con, but uh, yeah, it looks like this. So this is a team scenario, and it's basically just an open field with start zones for three players on each side and a score tracker. The This is not the current iteration of this this map i think uh i'm not sure actually i have to look at what's on tts but i think i think it might be but one of the things that this board in particular illustrates is that uh it's just an open field right so what you play on this uh you could come up with lots of unique scenarios using this uh this setup particularly obviously team-based stuff uh so just because the game boards aren't sort of separated and, and not modular, I mean, really any of the, the maps, including the one I just showed, The Great Race, um, are really flexible in terms of what you do on it. It's just a playing space. Uh, you can set out your own tokens and uh, create your own rules and, and 
say what you know what the wind condition is. So I will talk in that vein about uh, scenario creation. Um, so what I wanted to, to discuss on this topic was the idea of how some of the tokens were designed in the game. And this is just one example. There are others uh, that that I could show you if I could get the plastic off, but it, it doesn't really matter. So the purpose of the, the, this is what we call a rally token. And that's the number four because it's the one I could find. Um, so what these represent uh, primarily is for rally games. So when you uh, are doing a rally scenario, you're racing from point to point, one, two, three, four, you do it in that order. First one to reach the last point in the rally uh, wins the game. But these are double-sided and it's a number four on both sides, uh, but it changes color. So the reason that was done, even though it's never been implemented as a rule uh, in a particular scenario, it, is that it allows you to do things differently, right? So maybe the first person who gets to the number four, uh, something happens, uh, something special happens. Could be an event, could be they claim something, I don't know. And everyone else, um, like here's a, a simple example. So we have three colors of crystals, blue, pink, and um, yeah, sorry, blue, pink, and yellow, but this has a blue side and a pink side. You could do it so that uh, the, say it starts on this side, the first person who gets gets there, this is probably a bad example since the blue crystals are quite powerful, but let's say the first person who gets to it gets a blue crystal and it flips over and everyone else, when they land on it, they get a pink crystal if they don't already have one. That's just one example of how you could make special rules for the tokens just based on the fact that they have two different sides. And there are other examples of tokens like that in the game, particularly in first edition where there's a lot more tokens um, that are sort of customized. Um, most of the tokens in first edition are not actually even, uh, or not most, many of the tokens in first edition were, were created because of the idea of sandbox, but aren't necessarily used uh, at least not for their full potential in any of the scenarios in the game. Uh, they were they were there uh, because I assumed more people would love the idea of the sandboxing nature of the game and want to create their own scenarios. And there certainly are people who have done that. Uh, but because the audience ow, was uh, smaller, it was our first Kickstarter, um, the number of people who are going to do that is always smaller than the number of people who own the game. So. The objective was to focus the game on the core experience to let people play through the uh, a reduced number of scenarios in the, in the book, but that each of those scenarios would be uh, essentially better, uh, making sure that they're, each one is unique and represents something different that, so that people could easily go through and play all of the scenarios as opposed to just playing one or two or being intimidated by the huge, vast quantity. That being said, like, like I mentioned, each of those scenario maps um, have any number of alternative ways to play. And, and my intention is to have the, the core uh, scenario, uh, you know, put it on the left-hand side, but also have um, on the quadheroes.com website, like two or three alternative scenarios that you can play using that same board. Um, you know, it's just not gonna be printed in the, in the book itself, uh, but, you can just find the setup basically on, on the website as a single page that just says, use these tokens, here's the rules. Um, just as, an, uh, as a way to say, look, even though there are only 10 maps, which is actually significant, <laughs> uh, um, there's a, you know any infinite number of different scenarios you can play on these boards. So that's the, the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about. Uh, this is a long update, but it kind of addresses a bunch of the stuff that's been uh, discussed in the comments thread, um, particularly over the past few days. And I, as I said earlier in the in the update, I do intend to, you know, find out uh, about the uh, potential of reprinting the first edition game boards. Um, and then I'll send an update to you guys, like with rough pricing and how many of you would actually be interested. Because again, cost and uh, I need to make sure that I can uh, justify it and recover <laughs> recover the costs from, from producing them. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to sign off this update. Uh, there will be more coming, more changes in, in the next couple of days um, to the campaign page. Uh, 
keep spreading the word guys if you if you're in love with the idea of this game uh, share it with people uh don't forget to you know go to the wonderment games youtube channel like and subscribe you'll be notified when when content is produced same goes with instagram if you see a picture or something uh, on uh you know as part of the the quad heroes instagram page or the wonderment games instagram page feel free to share it like comment um and let people know about the campaign um i think i think we deserve to be uh getting more recognition than we do and let's let's keep it going thanks guys and uh see you soon i'll see you tonight if you uh tune in for the live stream okay bye